This episode was made possible by ExpressVPN. Start browsing the web securely with three months free by going to expressvpn.com slash MMI. On this episode of Meet My Inspiration, I have a great talk with Brian Volk Weiss. Brian is the CEO of the Nacelle Company and Comedy Dynamics, and he's a seasoned producer, director in the world of stand-up comedy. He's worked with some of the biggest names in comedy and has made quite a name for himself along the way. He's a hardworking, passionate, and wonderfully foul-mouthed guy. And you'll not only be inspired by his success story, but also by his incredible heart. And now, please welcome Brian Volk Weiss. Welcome, everyone, to Meet My Inspiration. I'm Chris Minion. My guest today is Brian Volk Weiss. Brian, thanks so much for joining me today on Meet My Inspiration. Thank you for having me. Uh, Brian, you're a pretty busy guy working on many projects at any given time. <clears throat> One way that you found to save time pertains to your unique approach to fashion. Uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, did I tell you? How do you know this? I've I know a lot about this. you. It's <laughs> really funny. Yeah, and I always like to preface it by this: like, this this is not like it was not inspired by Steve Jobs, the human being. It was inspired by I read this about Steve Jobs, and I'm like. That's really smart. And also to be completely honest, can I curse? Am I allowed yeah, to ahead. curse? I don't give a shit about fashion. So like, I was like, I could save a lot of time. And to be honest with you, frustration in the morning, because I don't care about this topic, but it seems to be important to other people. <laughs> so I was one day in the office and one of my colleagues was wearing a shirt exactly like this. I can't, it's a surfing company. That's the greatest irony. I went surfing once for about 11 minutes. I'm like, this is the worst thing I've ever done in my life. And I never did it again. But this is a surfing company called like Bowler. It starts with a V. And I was like, I'm going to get 24 of those shirts. <laughs> and I got 24 of those shirts. And I pretty much wear them. My Here's when I give them to, you know, people who need them. Uh, when you can start to see my belly button, that's when they've shrunk too much. And it's time to get another one. So I I am on my, I've been doing this, I think for eight years and I am the beginning of my third generation has started, but it's the same shirt and the same company for about eight years. Eight years. They are sponsoring yeah, yeah. this, right? You know, you think they would at this <laughs> point, but the right. problem is they do black on black. So you can't even see their logo, oh, which yeah. I kind of like. Well, you mentioned the name, so that's that's credit for them. Uh, let's go back to your childhood. So where did you grow up and how would you describe your upbringing? You know, it's interesting. I grew up in Queens, New York, and I, I like up until I kind of got into show business, I always thought I grew up in upper middle class. Then I realized I grew up in lower middle class. I literally, I was talking to my mom, like, I was probably about 26 or 27. I was talking to my mom and I was like, uh, I always thought we were upper class. And then she interrupted me and she was like, I, I was like, I always thought we were like upper middle class. And she like laughed. She goes, your dad and I made 90,000 a year combined living in New York city. Does that sound like upper middle class to you? And then my first response was, how did you even afford that house? Like, I mean, it was like, yeah. So it was, I had a great childhood, like, I mean, really no complaints, but yeah, in retrospect, yeah, we, we didn't have too much stuff. So as a kid, um, as a young kid, who did you look up to? Who did you admire? Two people, one was real, one was fake. Am I allowed to talk about fake people or is it only real people? Go ahead, both. So the real person was my grandfather, Bruno Volk. Uh, he, I, I mean, I, to say that I've never met anyone is impressive. It would be the greatest understatement ever. Wow. To give you the, the cliff notes of the cliff notes, um, my grandfather, who it bears mentioning was Jewish, uh, he got a feeling that these Nazis were not pretty good dudes. Uh, and everybody, he was in Austria, and everybody told him he was crazy, but he began the process in the mid thirties 
to come to the United States. And long story short, uh, with two weeks to spare, uh, he got out and he was able to leave Europe and come to the United States. Uh, his entire family died in the concentration camps. Uh, the first thing he did when he got here was try to join the US Army. And I, I literally have a letter from the War Department to my grandfather, and I, I'm gonna paraphrase, but the gist of the letter was, hey, Bruno, thank you so much for your interest. Um, we're kind of at war with the country you're from. <laughs> so we believe it or not, we got a rule about hiring people like that, but become a US citizen come back and apply again, and maybe we'll take you. But thank you so much for trying. And it took him about a year to get it. It didn't speak a word of English, by the way. Really? Not one fucking word of English. Spoke with the same accent the Nazis had. Like, I mean, literally, and he's like, I want to join the army. And yeah, eventually became a citizen. Tried again, joined the army, went back and fought the Nazis. Wow. Then he came back and was a doctor. And so my whole life, I grew up listening to his stories. And I, I would, and he also, it bears mentioning a wonderful, wonderful man. And it was a very important thing to be a good person, to be honorable, to be loyal. Like all these quote, like cheesy, like if you saw like dialogue between me and him in a movie, you'd be like, that's the cheesiest shit I ever saw. But he really spoke like that. Uh, and the other thing that I love, I'll never forget this. We were in an elevator once and uh, he was talking to me and this woman in front of us turned around and said to my grandpa, again, he sounded like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like he had a thick Austrian accent. And this woman turns, very nice, very nice question. She goes, oh, where are you from? And he goes, Chicago. <laughs> like he was so proud to be an American. So that was my first role model. And my second role model was Captain Kirk. But I wanna be very specific. Mm -hmm. It's the movies, Captain Kirk. Not the TV show. Not the TV show, Captain Kirk. And those, those are literally the only two <clears throat> things I've really looked up to my whole life. And, and Kirk in particular, no offense, Grandpa, Kirk in particular, I mean, basically wrote the code that I have run my entire life by. Elaborate on that a little bit. Well, in the classic film, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, there's a scene in the movie, everything I've done in my life, if anybody considers it successful, which I don't, but if other people do, it comes to this scene. There's a scene in the movie where the character says to him, um, you have to face death. You, you have to deal with the no-win scenario. And Kirk says, I don't believe in the no-win scenario. And then you realize, I don't want to give anything away. Actually, I don't care about that. It's a 40-year-old <laughs> movie, but I don't want to talk about Star Trek II for the next five hours. But the gist of it was, in the movie, one of the central themes of the film, it opens with this, is this test that all Starfleet officers take called the Kobayashi Maru, which is literally a test to see how a Starfleet cadet handles failure. Mm -hmm. So you're in a simulator, the ship gets attacked and your ship gets destroyed. But they don't know about that ahead of time. And it's literally, so Starfleet can watch before they hand over an $80 trillion spaceship, how will this person handle failure? Wow. And what Kirk did, and you find out halfway through the movie, was he had an inkling that this is what the test was about and he reprogrammed the computer, which was cheating, to save the ship. And when he was confronted about this, he said, he's like, I don't like to lose. So every single time in my career and in my life, it's been this year, many times, my whole life, whenever I have failed, whenever I'm in a situation that's bad, and I think other people may give up or try and start up, I just think I don't believe in the no-win scenario and I keep going forwards. And I know it's cheesy. I know it's William Shat, like I get it, but it's literally been the code I've run my life by. Seems to work for you. 
Um, you have managed and directed or produced special for some of the biggest comedians working today. Um, but as a kid, were you interested in comedy? It, 0.0. .0. The only caveat to that is Bill Cosby. So like my mom had literally about a thousand vinyl records. Let's say she had a thousand. I'm bad at math. She had a thousand. 999 were music. And then there was Bill Cosby. That is the only, to the point where like maybe even towards college, I didn't understand that stand up was, a, I thought it was just something like Bill Cosby did. Like I never, like, I didn't get the bigger picture of stand up until after I got out to LA. Wow. But you'd, you'd heard the Bill Cosby record. Did that, did that make you curious to, to, you know, listen to other comedians or find other comedians? You, you would think, right? But no, no, not at all. Zero. It's amazing. Yeah, it's kind of I your life. It's kind of your life now. And it didn't even begin yeah. until you got into the business. It was the most random thing ever, dude. I started interning for a manager. That manager, and by the way, even more random, I was working, I was interning for a guy for free and I was out of money and I was worried about rent. There was a guy I met who was interning for this manager that was getting paid 50 bucks a day cash. I took the job a hundred, I didn't know what a manager was. Yeah. I took it a hundred percent for the 50 bucks a day cash. No interest in, in that, management or comedy, zero. just cash All, Zero. All I wanted to do was direct movies like Star Wars. That's it. But I needed cash on my way towards doing that. Well, so changed, basically, changed, changed everything. Mm -hmm. So I started working for the guy on a Monday. That Saturday, he had hooked me up that I could go to the Laugh Factory because I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I, I'm always interested in anything I don't know anything about. So I was like, I'll go to, I, I went to a seven o'clock show just to see what it was. I stayed for the seven o'clock, the 930 and the midnight show. And I was hooked. Who did you see? Obviously, I don't remember everybody. No one's ever asked me this before. I'm so glad you asked. Here's who I remember. Dane Cook, Jeff Ross, and Harlan Williams. I can even tell you a Harlan Williams joke. It's a short one that it. he said that night. It was, did you ever, do you know that the pumpkin is the only organism on earth with triangle eyes? Which what? With triangle eyes. Oh, <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. And that's a good but memory. I even remember Jeff Ross joke. Like that's how much of an impact it had on me well, that was... first night. Yeah. I mean, those are some pretty big names in comedy, obviously. And they were, um, were they big at the time? Not at the fairly... time, by the way. Yeah. Not at the time. Dane couldn't sell a hundred tickets. Jeff <laughs> could sell 300 tickets. Um, yeah. So at the time they were Harlan, believe it or not, of those three names, Harlan, this was 1999. Mm -hmm. Of those three names, Harlan was the biggest. The biggest. He at was, the time. He was doing movies at the time, I think, right? Yeah. 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 So let's continue with this this thread here. Um, you got into managing comedians. Um, who were you managing in those early days? And what did you learn from managing comedians? Uh, I, I mean, it's it's one it's like that scene in The Karate Kid, man, where it's like he's like the famous scene where he gets annoyed and he's like, I came here to learn karate, and all you've done had me do is your chores, and then he realizes that trained him for how to do karate. I didn't realize how great my training was because the training wasn't just about how to deal with talent. The training was also, and I didn't realize this till I was out of it, the training was also how to deal with agents and managers. Mm. I deal with executives morning, noon and night at networks and studios that are mystified. I mean, mystified by agents and man, like, they, like, like they're like they Illuminati in a floating castle on Mars. Like they cannot understand and they default, they always default to, oh, it's always about the money. And 
this is probably the most important thing I learned about being a manager. It's rarely about the money. Mm. It's rarely about the money for the artist. In fact, it's almost never about the money. The most like, surprising thing about my management career, the amount of time and energy I had to spend convincing clients to take jobs. And 85% of the time, the clients needed the money. The, the job was a no brainer, would further their career. And I had to spend the amount of times I drove to clients' homes to beg them. The amount of clients I got to do jobs that made them famous, where I begged them to do it as a favor to me. Like that's what got them to say yes. I, in, I was, Why was it so challenging? I think artists, it's not that they think too much. It's that they, it, it, well, you have to ask yourself this question. Why are artists, comedians in particular, they're the smartest people you'll ever meet. Mm -hmm. No one is smarter than a comedian. Mm -hmm. You have to be a genius to do that. And yes, I'll even say it. Yes, Carrot Top has to be a genius. You, until you try, you don't understand how hard it is to do what they do. Have so you, the tried, question have that you McCoy, tried comedy, by the way? Question, never. But the one thing I did do, which I, like, I'm so glad I did it. One day, a friend of Dane Cook's and mine, he was doing a Tonight Show set and he was practicing it. And he went to this uh, karaoke joint called the Gower Gulch to practice his set because before the karaoke started, they had an open mic night. So there was like 20 people, maybe 10 people in the audience and like people were like getting bored and nobody was going up and my buddy wasn't even there yet. And Dane was like, dude, go up, do some jokes. I'm like, dude, I don't have any jokes. You know that. He's like, well, you know my act, do my act. <laughs> wow. Okay. So I went up and I did eight minutes of Danes. And I, dude, when I tell you I had it memorized, I had it fucking memorized. You were managing I had the, the time, right? Memorized. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, I managed him for 12 years. I, I had the words memorized, the speech patterns it memorized, the intonations memorized, everything. You were doing an impression. Yes, yes, I was. And by the way, other than the way I look, a dead on perfect impression of his act. To say that I bombed, <laughs> by the way, I knew 12 seconds in. This is fucking hard. Like I couldn't, even though I had been working with him for years, even though I'd been surrounded by comedians at that point for probably six or seven years, maybe eight, until I stood up there and tried it with who was soon to become the biggest comedian in 35 years mm -hmm. using his best material and bombing. What were you doing wrong? Can you analyze your-, your It wasn't your what I was doing wrong. It wasn't what I did wrong. It was those jokes work for him. Uh. So theoretically, I could spend time writing my own jokes. And then theoretically, I could go on stage and do them 200 times until they start to work. I theoretically could probably do that, but it just, you have to find out who you are to the audience and then give them that and play with that. So I couldn't just take his act and repeat it. Yeah. Uh, so you bombed horribly in your one and only time on stage. Um, after that, or did you think about maybe trying it again? Did you think about, like you said, writing no. your own jokes? No interest? Never, never, zero. You got, you got zero. destroyed and that was yeah. that. But it was, I, I mean, I never would have done it anyway. That was kind of like a random fluke. Yeah. I mean, to have a comedian say to you, not only do I want you to steal my jokes, but get up there and steal them in front of me. Yeah. Like just that. He that may have never happened again in the history of standup. He must so, have loved watching like, Bob. Dude, by the way, I didn't, if there were 10 people, nine were stone-faced, one person was falling out of his chair. It was literally, I've never seen him laugh so hard That's awesome. in all the time I've known him. Like, never seen him laugh that hard. <laughs> yeah, it was real. And by the way, he also found it fascinating because 
he saw what I was doing. He, yeah. he was blown away with how perfect I was with it, not just the words, but the speech patterns. That's what a lot of people don't understand about comedy. They always go timing, timing, timing. Mm. Yes, it's about timing. It's as much about the speech patterns interacting with the timing as it is about the material itself. Uh, Brian, you've been the producer or executive producer on dozens, I don't know how many uh, comedy specials. What exactly does it- Hundreds, look? hundreds. Okay, yeah. Literally hundreds. Shout it out. Um, what does a producer do on a comedy special? You're not writing, you're not directing. What, what does an pro executive producer, in fact, actually do for a comedy special? I, I can't talk about anyone but myself mm -hmm. because it's different for everybody. But here's what I'll tell you. If you came to the set when we were shooting, you would say, holy cow, this is the easiest, greatest job of all time. I don't even know why Brian's here. He should be across the street having a beer. If you saw what I did for the six months leading up to that day, mm -hmm. and then usually the two to four months after that day, mm -hmm. you would see what a producer does. So before the shoot, I got to get the talent to agree to do the deal. I got to get the network usually to agree to do the deal. I got to get them to want to work with each other. That's about half of my time. And then the other half is sometimes the network, like Ali Wong, nobody wanted it. Mm. Everybody passed. So I had to do a deal with her to get her to say yes for me to do it. Then I had to go shoot it. Then I had to go sell it. So that's what a lot of people don't understand. Like some of the biggest names that we work with, we did their first specials and everybody passed. So that's a big part of it as well. And then in post-production, it's giving notes on the cuts, which I don't give very many because of my management training. I trust the artist implicitly. So if they want notes from, like, what does Ali Wong give a shit about my notes? She doesn't, nor should she. But there are comedians that do care what I think. And then I'm happy to give them my notes. Once that's all done, then I see the color correction, the sound correction, and we have to either sell it, and that's a huge part of my job, and then we have to deliver it. Um, <clears throat> so let's see, you recently worked with um, Kevin Hart. Um, Kevin's hilarious, but he's also prolific and very hardworking and a very energetic guy. What do you think that people could learn from somebody like Kevin about being more productive? You know, it, it's, it's a very simple answer to a, a very great, complicated question. Mm -hmm. um, walk the walk. Kevin says stuff all day long that a billion people say every day. Yeah. But Kevin does it. Kevin's up early. He works late. He is a professional. He shows up 20 minutes early. After he raps, he hangs out and shoots the shit. He asks a million questions. So it's like, I would say he's very talented and he's very funny. And I hope he's not offended when I say this, but I think he and I, the main thing we have in common that's allowed both of us to have some degree of success, he's had a little more to me, um, but just hard work. It's yeah. literally just hard work. Like I'm not smarter or better than anybody else who hasn't done what I've done. I just, if I had to guess, I worked harder than they did. I worked longer hours. It's really that simple. What do you think it is um, maybe inside a person like Kevin or inside a person like yourself? We all know it, theoretically, hard work, but a lot of people just don't wanna put in the hard work. What is it about you or a guy like Kevin that you just have that kind of fire in your belly? Where does that come from, do you think? I really can't answer this for Kevin. Like, I, I mean, my theory for Kevin is his upbringing, like just gave him so much inspiration to never have to worry about anything. Mm -hmm. But so, but that's for him to answer. I, I really don't know the answer. What about that. you? I just, I, I hate failing. I came out to Hollywood with a goal, a huge goal. And I just don't want to fail. And every day I wake up, 
everything I, it's like maximize the minute, maximize the hour, maximize the day, maximize the month. Ma like if, if you work an extra hour a day, that's five extra hours a week. That's, I'm not the best with math, but I think that's an extra, what is that? An extra 250 hours a year about, right? And then how many days is 250 hours? Now compare yourself to someone only working eight hours a day. Like it's literally that simple because what I've learned is when you work hard and I working hard is such a vague thing to say. What I really mean to say is working long hours. If you work long hours, it gives you a statistical hedge against failure. Because if I work 10 hours and I develop one thing, if that shits the bed, I'm fucked. If I work 20 hours and I develop three things, two of them can shit the bed. And then you guys are all congratulating me on how great I'm doing because the third thing worked. But the truth of the matter is, I've done, if you think I'm doing okay, dude, I'm telling you with no bullshit, I have a 98 to 98%, 98 to 99% failure rate over the course of my career. And the only way I've been able to pay my bills and have a mortgage and three kids and, and run my company is by negating that failure rate with extra hours. It's a good technique. Um, so like you said, you've been a part of uh, hundreds of stand-up specials. <clears throat> Thousands. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's getting bigger. Uh, is there a particular stand-up special um, that you are most proud of, or maybe one that had a, a great or surprising impact on the audience? Is there one that stands out in your mind? There's nothing I'm the most proud of, because that would upset 199 people. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one of the ones I'm very proud of is, again, just to go back to her, is Ali Wong. Mm. I'll, my, so I'll tell you two stories about that special. Number one, I'm in the taxi pulling up to the venue, the Neptune in Seattle, and I'm on the phone with one of the most successful, respected agents in the history of comedy. If there was a hall of fame for managers and agents, he would be in it. Mm -hmm. He hears me on the phone paying the taxi driver. This was before Uber, or at least before I was aware of Uber. And he's like, oh, uh, are, where are you? Are you shooting something? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in front of the Neptune. We have a shoot. He goes, oh, who are you shooting? And I go, Ali Wong. He says, you know you can say no, right? And again, this was not some random... This was one of the, this guy's client list is one of the greatest client lists in the history of representation, not just comedy. Well, obviously Ali's so that, huge now. Um, so, so, so we shoot the special. This is the second story. Okay. I send a special and this is the way I always do it to this day. I write an email. And I send it to, depending on what year it is, either four places or six places. It's always changing, you know, going up and down. And I'm like, dear so-and-so, hope you had a good weekend, uh, blah, 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 blah. And I hit send. I never know what's going to happen. This is the only time in my career this has happened. I had a bidding war. And not only, I've never had a bidding war any other time in my career. Never. That's the only bidding war of my career. Four-way bidding war. Wow. So I've never even had a two-way bidding war. I had a four-way bidding war for that special. And that guy who said that, you know, you know, you can say no, right? That guy would have would probably literally chop off a thumb now to represent her. So that's that, that's one of my favorite stand-up stories. That's a great story. Um, let's change the topic a little bit. You have a great... Uh, admiration for Ulysses S. Grant. Um, I'm yes. curious. I'm curious why, why him in particular? Why is he so appealing to you? And what is something about him that might surprise people? 
Well, it's getting harder to answer the second question because nobody knew who the hell he was until this year. Now everybody knows him. Yeah. Um, I, I, one of my life goals is to read a book about every president. So about 15 years ago, I got to Grant. I was dreading it. Everybody knows Grant sucks. Everybody knows he's a terrible president. I put it off for months. I finally start reading it. And I mean, I, dude, I tell you this, no bullshit. I was literally crying almost the entire book. I mean, wow. I, the book, I don't know if it literally looks like it was in the rain, but I was bawling my eyes out the entire time I read the book. I, even now talking about it, I feel I'm getting emotional. Wow. This guy, up until the day the Civil War started, when he was in his early 40s, failure, 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 failure. The day the Civil War began, he was pretty much homeless. He technically had a home because someone let him like shack up in a barn, basically. Uh -huh. He was selling firewood on street corners firewood that he had found in a forest. So he literally was in a forest finding wood on the ground. He didn't even have an ax and he would pick up a pile and go to like downtown, I think it was Cincinnati and like try and sell firewood to people. He, he was fucked. Five years later, he's the head of the, he was the, up until Eisenhower, he was the first, uh, he was the first, what's the word? The, the the he was the I forget the term, but only George Washington, Grant, and Eisenhower have had the title. So he literally was the first, five years after being almost homeless, he has the same rank as George Washington. Seven years later, he's president of the United States. And what I learned from that book was, and this is what I use, this is what I said to sell the show. There's no Lincoln without Grant. And there sure as hell is no United States without Grant. Mm -hmm. Lincoln was heading towards a loss. You know, one of the interesting things about Grant is actually the stuff people don't understand about Lincoln and the Civil War. One of Lincoln's greatest things that he did, which he gets no credit for, uh, is the majority of the United States, the North, no problem with the South leaving, none. Like everybody was like, yeah, yeah, let them go. They don't do shit. Lincoln's almost single-handedly said, not only are they not going, we're, we're going to fuck them up. So start making uniforms and, and, and bullets because we're, we're going to get them back. That's why up until Grant, the war was going so badly was because all the generals didn't believe in it. And they didn't want their reputations screwed up because they got thousands of Northerners killed. Grant comes in and I, maybe it's because he had nothing to lose. I don't know, but he was the guy that turned the war around and then Lincoln capitalized on that. So, and then if that's not enough, he literally held the country together. Another thing people forget, Yeah. <clears throat> imagine if for some bizarre reason, when FDR is running for president the fourth time, he's like, you know who'd be a great vice president? Himmler. Let me see if Himmler wants to be vice president. And then Himmler becomes the vice president in 1945. FDR dies. And all of a sudden, a fucking Nazi is the president of the United States. That's what happened with Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson. Yeah. Andrew Johnson owned slaves believed in slavery he was like literally the poster child of the confederacy except for a tiny technical reason didn't agree that the south should leave the north so for three and a half years actually three years and like 48 weeks grant holds the country together during andrew johnson's presidency he also doesn't want to run for president that's another great thing about grant mm. the only reason he ran for president was because he knew the fucking civil war would start again if he didn't. So he runs for president, he wins. And then there's another thing about Grant, most people don't know, four times in his first term, he had to get on a horse. The first time he went with 100,000 troops. 
The last time, I shit you not, I think he went with eight dudes and just rode down to Savannah and was literally like, you motherfuckers want to fight again? And then they went back into their homes and calmed down. Had, and it, it's because it was him that they backed off. So he literally held the country together for 12 years, including Johnson. And that was enough time for the country to heal. And it's why the country was united when Hitler did come to power. So long answer, apologies. You're very passionate about it, obviously. <clears throat> well, let's-, let's my, uh... my first son is named after him. Wow, really? My, my, about... my, all my kids are named after presidents. Wow, I didn't realize that. Let's talk about another book that you uh, have mentioned uh, called Long Tail. I think you, you read it in 2006, or at least it was written and released in 2006. Um, what is Long Tail about and what kind of impact did it have on you? I mean, it changed my whole life. Um, I think it was written in 05 and I read it in 06. Okay. And the re normally who gives a shit about dates, but in this case, it really matters. Mm -hmm. um, so I read it in 06. That's before YouTube. That's before Netflix was streaming. That's before the iPhone. Mm -hmm. That's before all of the shit that basically made my career possible existed. So, you know, in Back to the Future 2, the almanac is like this big thing. This was my almanac because basically what happened was the book predicted everything that would happen. Now, the thing I pat myself on the back for was I went all in. I was like, if the book's wrong, fuck it. I'll go teach history somewhere. What did the book but predict I specifically? All, well, what, sorry, that's a great, what, what I meant was, or what I should add to that, what does all in mean? So at that point in my career, I was producing between zero and two stand-up specials a year. Mm -hmm. And those specials, because keep in mind, I was a manager, those specials were for the companies I made them for or for my clients. So like I would have a client, I would, as a manager, I would sell one of my clients specials to Comedy Central. And either Comedy Central or my client would own the special. I would get a producing fee, but that was it, or a commission. Mm -hmm. After I read The Long Tail, I said, if the book's right, there's going to be a lot of value to owning stand-up specials. So I went from making zero to two a year for other people to at first making about 10 a year for myself, mm. then 20 a year, then 30 a year. And then I would license them, which is like a temporary sale. Um, and then as the rights reverted back, I had this crazy thing called a library. And then now, and this, by the way, this saved our ass during COVID. I mean, the only reason I didn't have to lay off anybody or do pay cuts is because our library makes money every day. Mm. So that's what the long tail did. But what the long tail said, it predicted this thing, which now you'll be like, and I, people are like, I'm going to get the book. Whenever I talk about it, they're like, I'm going to get the book. I'm like, don't. You will be bored out of your I'm goddamn mind. Man. Yeah. But what the book said that I took away from it, it predicted this thing called unlimited shelf space, mm. which in 2006, I'll be completely honest with you, even though I dedicated my career and risked everything to pursue this, I didn't even completely understand what that meant. But the what the book said was, if Walmart has 80 feet for CDs, they must get Britney Spears because those 80 feet must make as much money as possible. But in the digital world, when you don't have to make money vis-a-vis -vis square footage, it's unlimited. And that's what inspired me to do everything we did. That's great. Um, another thing that you did was the Netflix series, um, called The Toys That Made Us. And I guess by looking behind you, uh, you clearly have a passion for toys. Um, it's out of hand now, by the way. Yeah, speaking of unlimited shelf space, it doesn't look like you have unlimited shelf space back there. 
You, um, you so, should see that side of the room. Say that again? You should see that side of the room. What, what you what can't see. What percentage of this is, is it behind you? This is a, a fifth of the collection. Wow. All right, so let's say that you know your house catches on fire and you can only grab, let's say, three of those things. What are you going for? Thanks to climate change uh, and the state of California, uh, I have twice had to evacuate my house. Uh, so I can answer that question. Okay. Um, I have uh, the R2-D2, two Lego minifigs, and two models, tiny diecast models of two different enterprises that were mine uh, from when I was a kid. And Is that when one we had the less than half, no, it's all, I can get it if you want. Uh, it's all the way up there on a, one okay. of the walls okay. you can't see. But by the way, they are of almost zero value ah. financially. But the first time we had to evacuate, uh, I had less than half an hour to get out. Those were the things I took. That's amazing. Like I ran in here, grabbed those and left. Just and there are things in here of value. Yeah, I probably there. You you grab the ones that were more important to you. Yeah, I mean those were to me those are irreplaceable. Almost everything else in this room is replaceable because I didn't play with it when I was eight. Those, they, I mean they they my entire career path was affected by those toys and therefore my life. I didn't realize your house had actually nearly caught on fire and you'd had that experience. That's amazing. <clears throat> Ironically, the second time, like we could see the flames from our backyard, not the first time, but we now have a whole plan for evacuating. It's lovely. I wasn't planning to ask you this, but have you thought about leaving? I mean, there is kind of an exodus from, from LA um, recently, just, you know, the taxes are out of control, climate change, um, the homeless population is kind of getting out of hand. Have you, have you thought about leaving? So the answer is yes, but... I've hated this city and this, well, the state's okay. I, I have hated this city since the day I got here. Uh, so I've always wanted to leave. So I've always been thinking about leaving. Um, I, I'll be here another 10 years uh, and then I will be very far away from this state. Could you do what you do in another city? I mean, obviously, you know, you live in Hollywood and you work in Hollywood. If you did move somewhere else, could you still do what you do? I always thought I could, but thanks to my good friend COVID, I now know for sure that I can. Like, yeah. I mean, I've I've been running. I, I've not only as not only have I been running the company like normal for eight months. Mm -hmm. We've sold shows from my toy room. We've like like nothing has really changed except I'm not going to Burbank. That's interesting because a lot of people are hurting because of COVID and, and you know the, the impact that it's had on the economy. Um, has has anything good come up during COVID for you and, and your your company? I, I it's a it's a tough question to answer because of exactly what you said. Like people are dying. Yeah. Families are losing mothers and fathers and children. To use a word that I've said more in 2020 than the rest of my life combined times a trillion, literally, we have been blessed. None of our shows were canceled. We've been able to sell more shows and our library and distribution system has actually been helped by COVID. So, and then ironically, which I didn't even really understand it was going on for about four or five months because we had to stop shooting new specials mm -hmm. for the most part, we weren't spending money. So not only was our income going up because more people were at home watching stuff, um, but we weren't spending money to make new stuff, which again, don't worry, I'll make up for that next year. I mean, I'll have to spend more than I've ever spent in a year to get caught up. But yeah, to answer your question directly, it, we've, we, we have been, we've been so blessed, man. Like four of our five shows that were in production in March were at Netflix. Mm -hmm. No, sorry. 
four of our six shows were at Netflix. This is what I mean when I tell you I was blessed. I got a call from the executive at Netflix who covers our show. I saw it on my phone. I was positive. He was calling to tell me all of our shows were being put on hiatus. And he's like, hey man, I just wanna let you know, you're gonna see some really bad, scary news uh, tomorrow on Deadline Hollywood. Uh, none of that affects you or your shows. Uh, like I said, I get emotional. Um, he said, just keep working. So that had nothing to do with me or my company or my shows or anything. Mm -hmm. Like that was just Netflix being Netflix. And mm -hmm. you know, if those shows had all been canceled, we would have been hurt real bad. How many people were you able to keep employed throughout the- Everybody, Netflix? everybody. We didn't let go a single person. What's the number? I'm just curious. It's about 70 full-time and then, uh, you know, over a hundred part-time. That's awesome. That's great that you were able to do that. Uh, Brian I mean, no pay cut, nothing. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, very lucky. That's great. What and, and it really, again, this isn't me being humble. Go ahead. This is like, we were lucky. We yeah. were very blessed. Nobody could have predicted that. No. What are some of your upcoming projects that you're most excited about? Ooh. Well, today, we had a big day today. We had two different shows premiere on Netflix. One is uh, the movies that made us. Uh, it's the holiday edition. Right. So those came out today. And we also have a special we did called Nate uh, that also came out today. Uh, that's a um, pretty, pretty cool show, to put it mildly. Not what you would think. Um, so that just happened today. And then we have a show we're doing for Disney Plus called Behind the Attraction with Dwayne Johnson. Uh, which is a deep, deep dive into some of the uh, non-Disney employees call them rides. Uh, Disney employees uh, call them attractions. Yeah. So I'll call them an attraction. Uh, so uh, um, yeah, so that's coming out in Q1. And uh, I'm, I'm a huge Disney nutcase, to put it mildly. So I'm, I, again, another show where I couldn't even believe they paid us to make it. I mean, it was the stuff that we saw, like behind the scenes stuff that we yeah. saw, I still cannot believe what's, they showed it to us. What's an example of that? I can't give you anything specific, but I can give you two stories that will make the point. Okay. One day, basically after the show was greenlit, and I still don't know if Disney did this on purpose or not, but they kind of, they kind of were like, um, we're gonna give them, we're gonna have like a month of like, cause we're giving you access to everything and everybody, but you don't work here. So you don't know what we're doing. We're gonna spend a month showing you everything. So in my own stinky, slimy fingers, I held the contract, this I can tell you, I held the contract that founded the Disney Corporation. Like, it was the greatest thing ever. The guy's wearing fucking gloves. And he hands me, and I'm like, uh, I'm not wearing gloves and probably too much information. I kind of do have a little sweaty hand thing. And he's like, ah, here you go. I'm like, yeah. So I literally held that in my own hands. But to give you a really good story, even though I'm not telling you anything. Okay. One day, you know, every morning I wake up, I look at my schedule. They're like, go to this address in Glendale. I'm like, all right. So I get to a building. I've driven past it probably 2,000 times. Never looked at it twice. I go in. By the way, I probably shouldn't even be saying this story. I go in, and this is how I'll describe it. They showed us something that if there was a camera behind me filming what we were looking at, anyone who saw this video would bet every single dime they had in the bank that it was CGI. It was like, I literally turned to one of my co-producers and I was like, is, is that real? And he's like, I think so. like it was bonkers. It'll be in the parks in five or six years and you'll probably know what I'm talking about. Okay. But 
And by the way, my first thought looking at it was, if this is what Disney's doing, what the fuck is the Air Force doing? Like, wow. what's the army got going? Like, I mean, it was bonkers. But then the other thing they did, which is truly, other than anything connected to my family, in the top three greatest things that's happened to me in my life, we did a third shift tour of Disneyland in Anaheim. That is the uh, 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. shift. Mm -hmm. Dude, we saw everything. Mm -hmm. We walked through the haunted mansion with all the fucking lights turned on. We walked through Magic Mountain with all the lights turned on. We saw them. Dude, I knew it was coming for months. I assumed it would be me and my crew walking around an abandoned Disneyland. At four in the morning, I finally turned to one of the guides. I was like, was there th like, how many people are here? He's like, probably about 4,000. What? There are 4,000 employees oh working God. at the park. At that time? While it's closed. Well, it, dude, it's the kind of shit that's obvious, but until you see it, you don't think about it. Yeah. They're not going to be practicing parades in the middle of the day. So like we were there, I think in October, they were practicing. No, I think we were, we must've been there in September or August. They were practicing the Thanksgiving parade. Hundreds of people in costume. Yeah. That's incredible. So yeah, it was stuff like that. When we were at Disney Paris, like, you know, we got to go to the top of the castle. They, like, I mean, we do, we saw it. I cannot believe what they let us see. Yeah. We were routinely with Disney employees who had worked there for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. They were seeing it for the first time with us. Oh, wow. Like, I mean, it was nuts. Yeah. Yeah, it was really crazy. That's going to be a great yeah. show. I'm excited to see and, it. And the beautiful thing about it. Oh, sorry. What'd you say? Sorry. I just said I'm excited to see the show. It sounds great. Oh, I hate to tell you. Very little that's in the show. Uh, so it's still, there's still tons of stuff you've never seen and tons of stuff you've never known. But like, we were talking to this guy one day early on and he was like, he basically showed us a color coded map of Disneyland. And I was like, what are those colors? Cause he was trying to show us something else like with geography. But then I was like, what are all those colors? And he's like, oh, I'm making this up. But this is what he said. He was like, Oh, you see the yellow? That's what we're doing in 2027. You see the blue? That's what we're doing in 2024, 2034. And I go, hold on a second. We're sitting here in 2019 and you're planning out what you're doing in 2034? And he's like, well, think about it. If we're building a new land and we have to tear up all this ground. We know we're not building that land for 10 years. So if we're tearing up this street for some reason, if the street's already torn up, why wouldn't we lay all the pipes and wires now? Because then we could save money mm. in 2034. Wow. And then the other thing he said, which I still can't, it's like, it blew my mind. One of the attractions uses projectors. When they, sometimes it takes five years to design a ride. So they don't know what projectors are going to be on the market three to five years later. So like they have to work with Samsung and Philips, not only to figure out how big are the brackets to hold a projector that's not even being designed yet. They didn't got to buy 20 years of light bulbs, 20 years of batteries, 20 years of backup parts, because that projector has to work for 20 years. Incredible. So that's what the show is going to show you to a certain degree. Like there's magic and then there's magic. And like, that's, that's what we'll be showing stuff like that, where you'll never look at the stuff the same way. Brian, you're a lucky guy because it's it's clear that you're so passionate about the lucky, you and, and the luckiest. I, I think so. I mean, you, you have a great career. 
and you're doing what you love and you, you, you love what you do. Um, so Brian, I want to thank you for your time today. Um, it's been great. To thank hear you for yours, man. Really. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, but love. Yeah. Really enjoyed this. Great questions. Thank you. My thanks to Brian for his time and for sharing his story with me. Many of his latest projects are found all across the internet, but check out the movies that made us streaming on Netflix and one of his favorite comedy specials he was involved with, Ali Wong, Baby Cobra, also on Netflix. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Meet My Inspiration, and I hope we've been able to inspire you too, even if just a little. Sometimes that's all it takes to make great things happen. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like broadcasting to the world everything you do online. Here's how to protect yourself and get three months for free. Did you know that your internet service provider knows every single website you visit? And what's worse is they can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who will use your data to target you. ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. ExpressVPN works on all devices, phones, laptops, even routers, so that everyone who shares your Wi-Fi is protected too. And the best part is using ExpressVPN is super easy. Just fire up the app, click one button, and you're protected. ExpressVPN is the world's number one rated VPN by TechRadar, Wired, The Verge, and countless others. So if you believe your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com slash MMI, and you can get an extra three months for free. That's expressvpn.com slash MMI.